Hey what's going on guys, this is Andrew Chicken and welcome back to another video. I know it may not look like it, but I am in fact on the PTS right now because a new update has just dropped on the PTS here for us to test out and it's got a whole bunch of stuff. We've got some balance changes to discuss as well as a brand new, very exciting PvE mode. So we're going to be talking about all of it in today's video. So if you want to follow along with the title surge PTS patch notes, then of course there will be a link to that in the description, but uh, yeah, let's talk about wave defense which is a brand new pve experience for paladins so um <laughs> Us Paladins fanboys, we could officially say that Paladins has gotten pve with talents before Overwatch. <laughs> Gosh, man, it's um it's it's sad. I'm sad about what they did to Overwatch, man. We got robbed, but uh, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Paladins. So, PvE experiences are nothing new to Paladins. That's true. The game has had different takes on PvE throughout the past. None of them were particularly fleshed out and, well, kind of a mixed bag in terms of their quality. But uh, this is a passion project from the devs that they've slowly worked on to create a new experience that allows players to play a more developed vision of what those modes could be like. So that is what Wave Defense is. And currently, it's important to note that on the PTS here, and possibly for the first few iterations of the Wave Defense in the live game itself, it's kind of like a beta mode, right? We're going back to the Paladin's beta with this. Um, it's not totally polished there are some issues with it like there's not an announcer playing the music's not playing uh th the bots can be a little bit silly at times and they're working on refining the waves refining the champions the abilities the ai all of that to make the best experience possible and they really are going to depend on player feedback for determining how they want to change the mode, how they can make it better, and how they can scale the difficulty to make sure it's a fun and rewarding experience without being too difficult. So definitely get on the PTS and when it's in live servers as well, play it in live servers and feel free to give the devs constructive feedback because this has a lot of potential to be awesome and it's up to us to make sure that we give constructive criticism and help them uh, out with making a really good PvE project because this is actually super exciting. Paladins has a lot of tools at its disposal to make PvE interesting, right? We have the item store, we have the talents, the loadouts, and of course the very diverse champion roster with a lot of special abilities. So yeah, it'll be very cool to see how this evolves. But yeah, let's talk about how it works. So the basics are, you survive 10 minutes against waves of combatants who slowly escalate in number and difficulty. There are basically four different waves. The first wave starts out very easy with kind of trash level uh, mobs, and it slowly escalates. And the fourth wave is, uh, <laughs> it's actually pretty insane. It gets intense. You get swarmed, and it's actually a surprising amount of fun, and it's reasonably challenging, too, if we're being totally honest. Uh, the one major issue they have right now is it's not very optimized either, so you do kind of lag a lot. But, uh, yeah... It's, uh, it's actually pretty fun, that fourth wave. So yeah, you have to protect the objective from all of these enemies to prevent the horde from draining your tickets. And the horde wins if you lose 30 tickets. So if you die to the horde, that loses you one ticket, and the objective will also drain one ticket every three seconds it's left uncontested. So you have to stop them from getting to the objective, and if you die trying, you also lose points. So you do not want to die in this mode. It is very bad to die in this mode. And uh, also also, random power-ups have a chance of spawning after a kill, allowing players to claim brief buffs. So, you know the power-ups that have featured in previous limited time modes, those are going to be in wave defense as well, and it provides a nice boost and also, you know, changes up the gameplay a little bit. So, yeah, that is really cool. Now, there are two ways to queue for it, and there are three different experiences. So, let's talk about how you queue for it up first. There is the public matchmade queue. And there's also, and this is very interesting, the private queue. So the matchmade queue is just like any normal limited time mode uh, queue. You just queue up, you get placed with four other randoms, and enjoy wave defense with a full team. However, the private version. <laughs> this allows players to play on their own. We can have... In 2024, a single-player Paladin's experience that's actually like real gameplay and not just sitting in the shooting range. That's pretty nifty. So you can play by yourself or with up to four friends. So you can have a varying party size and 
the version will actually scale based on the number of players. So if you are a solo player, it won't be spawning a ridiculous, overwhelming amount of enemies. It'll still be pretty difficult, because the pressure is all on you, and if you die, oh my gosh, you're gonna lose. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it won't overwhelmingly just swarm you like it would if you had five players in the lobby. So that scaling difficulty based on your party size is actually really neat and surprisingly well thought out for um, a feature in Paladins. That sounds like a diss. It kind of is, but... Uh... <laughs> What am I saying? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very, very cool to see this. I am very pleasantly surprised by the fact that you can do a, uh, a private version of this. Now, the experiences. There are three different versions of this PvE. You have the Corrupted Burrow, where you basically follow the events of the Burrowed Within Chronicle and protect Brightmarsh and the Burrows from Yagaroth's brood of hatchlings and various darkness monstrosities. So you fight Yagaroth, Drogos, Corrupted Io, and uh, Vora. And Drogos is also using the Terror Morph skin, which is it's kind of been retconned to be a darkness skin. So a bunch of minions, a bunch of spooky darkness characters, but honestly, because Yagaroth is a bit buggy when it comes to her bot, this is the easiest of the three by far. Then we have Forgotten Altar. Deep within the Skadron ruins of Primal Court, the Pyre has hidden away an altar preserving an ancient weapon. Curious champions are encouraged to look into it by Tiberius, but Azan refuses to allow them. So, you're fighting Azan, Corvus with the Pyre skin, uh, Koga with the Pyre skin, and I think Tyra with the Pyre skin as well. And uh, the Azans are pretty difficult because they will uh, they will definitely be trying to stun you. <laughs> they will stun you a lot. So you got to be very careful there. And then Dark Tides. This is a reimagining of the original Dark Tides mode. And it takes place on Marauder's Port where corrupted cultists are performing a ritual to amplify the powers of the Kraken. So this is full on Abyss. And you're trying to stop the Abyss from punishing you for heresy against their lords. So this has Abyss cultist Vatu. Um. The Abyssal Furious skin, there's also Dredge, and then Rom. And the Roms, oh boy, they are very spooky. They will ult you, they will run into you and knock you around. Honestly, I think Dark Tides is the most hectic of the three when it comes to that final fourth wave. It is, it is brutal and it is a blast. So that is the PvE mode for the absolute first beta iteration of it that is coming in the Tidal Surge PTS notes. And again, make sure to try it out on the PTS, make sure to try it out in live servers as well, and give constructive feedback, because, well, we can determine how this mode goes going forward. We, we can determine the difficulty, we can give them advice on, uh, yeah, how to change the waves to make them more fun, or new enemies with new attacks, or anything like that. And if it's a success, I'm sure they'll be thinking of other PvE things they could do in the future, like, uh, gosh, you know what I want to see? A lore accurate Yagaroth boss fight PVE event. That would be so awesome. And projects like that are more likely to happen if this does succeed. So, yeah, definitely try it out. Give them your thoughts and, yeah, just enjoy it for what it is, which is a, yeah, a very unique experience as far as Paladins is concerned. Now let's talk about trials and the event pass and some other nonsense. <laughs> so we have the trial challenges here. Most trial challenges are being reduced in their scaling, so they are a lot easier to complete. So you can pause the video and read these if you want. I'm not going to read them out. Uh, they're all still pretty boring and will be much, much easier to complete now. So yeah, just you'll be able to get the free stuff from the trials a lot easier. Simple as that. Then we have the Buried Treasure Flashback Event Pass. Yeah, they're doing another flashback pass. There are no new skins this update, apart from uh, Phase 2 of the Recolors, which we'll get to a bit later. But yeah, this Buried Treasure flashback event pass comes with uh, skins curated from the Shore Patrol, Pirate's Treasure, and Dark Depths Battle Passes. So you'll be able to get five unique skins, and if you already own this event pass, or all the skins in this event pass rather, you will get more crystals than you put into it, as with the last flashback event pass. But if you are someone who already has all these skins, then yeah, there's no new cosmetics coming this update, which... Uh... Eh, kind of a bit disappointing, if you ask me, but apparently it was a successful enough event pass for them to do a second one, so I guess that's good for a lot of people? I, I don't really know. Finally, we have limited time modes here, and this is just amazing. <laughs> so, the first limited time mode, this is a new limited time mode, 
Leon, I shrunk the realm. <laughs> oh no, Ray, what have you done? Enjoy a version of TDM where every time you manage to get an elimination, your champion shrinks by 10% in size and health while moving faster and jumping higher. So the more kills you get, <laughs> the smaller you become until you're just a little fly zip zipping around, but you also have very little health, so you're you're gonna feel like a fly. Someone's gonna just swat you, and you'll die, and it'll be very uncomfortable. Uh, so this seems just like a very silly mode. The effect can stack up to five times. So yeah, watch where you step as tiny champions fight to see who can become the smallest bean. <laughs> and then we have miniature balance patch notes. For the truly talented mode, this this is incredible. This mode was a rocking success. Uh, this was one of the best limited time modes of all time, and they have improved it. So they've added a few new talents and actually done some balance changes to improve the existing talents that were already there that were really painful the last time around. So we have a new Bomb King talent, Pop and Lock. Poppy Bomb now deals 500 extra damage and cripples for 2 seconds. Very spicy. Imani is added to the champion pool and has a talent called Equilibrium, which grants her 30% increased cast speed for 3 seconds after using Elemental Shift, so generally just shooting a lot faster. Uh, Moldamba's Wakono's Curse has been nerfed. Thank goodness for that. It went from 900 damage over 3 seconds to 560 over 2 seconds, so a substantial nerf, and I believe this is back to the value that it was originally way back in the day, which is good. Pip has a new talent called Lead Vial. This is very, very spicy. Healing potions now only activate when directly hitting a target and may persist in the world for 10 seconds after hitting a surface. Reduces cooldown of healing potion by 3 seconds. So... Potentially a very, very powerful potion. I'll be very curious to see how this feels. Um, and then, Saris the Void Protects, another nerf, now caps it at 500 children per target. If you played this mode, you should remember how obnoxious Saris was, because she was giving people more than 2,000 shield health with Guardian. It was insane. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing that this has been capped. My gosh. Zin has... Two talent updates, so he has a new talent called Blade Master, which makes him deal 30% more damage to enemies within 20 feet of you. Or for people who use real units, um, <laughs> that's uh, a little over 6 meters away from you, I think. So, basically turning him into a kind of a melee-ish sort of character. And then Retaliation now makes counter last one second longer, so the talent is able to be used a bit more effectively, because back in the day you would pair this talent with a card that increased the duration of counter. That card doesn't exist now, so Retaliation felt worse than it did back in the day. This should make it feel better. So, that's all very exciting. And then finally, Yagroth. <laughs> this is the spiciest change here, I think. She has been added to the champion pool with a new talent called Defensive Curl. While in Hardening, you are immune to anti-heal. Dead Zone be gone, Cauterize be gone, you become hard, you get healed. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, that sounds ridiculously, ludicrously powerful. Um, so yeah, wow. They have just gone through and done a balance pass for truly talented, added a bunch of new talents. Honestly, this seems just like a testing ground for silly, wacky talent ideas that they had. And, um, I mean, if we like some of the talents, then hey, maybe they'll put them into the real game, I don't know. But, uh... That's super exciting to see. I love this limited time mode so much. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to see the positive response. Now, before we move on to the balance, I do want to show the uh, the actual new skins this update. Although, they're actually really, really, really old skins. So, you know how in the last patch, they brought back a bunch of skin recolors uh, that were removed way back when? Because, I don't know, because of the Switch or something. I don't remember the reason. But, uh, yeah, those skins have all been brought back in their entirety now. So we have a ton more recolors from way back in the day. All 68 of them are in this chest, which you can buy for 100 crystals. They'll also be priced for gold in the live servers. And, yeah, <laughs> these are really, really nice, some of them. Like, Purple Cassie, oh my gosh, it's just the cutest thing ever. I love that. Um, and, yeah, there are just a ton of things here, including recolors for actually old models, as you can see here. Aqua Sky, uh, Blush Sky. So, and also, in particular, I want to show you these Drogo skins. I think these have to be the highest quality skins of the entire roster. Drogo. Look at this. Drogos. Royal Blue Diamond Armor Drogos. Absolutely phenomenal. Red Furious Drogos. So, so clean. And then, Royal Purple Drogos. 
literally has the regal color scheme. And, of course, you know, he has a crown on his tail as well. So, like, that is just awesome. <laughs> really high-quality recolors. We can go through a lot of the older champions and see their different recolors. And, yeah, a bunch of champions that didn't get them last patch got them now. For instance, Barrack has a purple recolor and a green recolor and his blue recolor. So, bunch of recolors there. And it's all just very, very nice. So, yeah, I am super happy to see that. They never should have been removed in the first place. And now that they're back, well, we have more skin options to choose from, and I think that's always a fantastic thing. So first, let's talk about the item balance. This is very, very spicy. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about probably the most... Uh, is it the most prominent item change? There are two really crazy item changes here. So I guess let's just go with armor plating up first. It's, it's first in alphabetical order, okay? So this item got a giga nerf. Like alarm bells going off type of nerf. This, well, the scaling is the same, the price is the same, so what changed? Well, this will reduce the damage you take from in-hand weapons while you're not affected by crowd control. And that is the kicker. So if you're affected by any kind of crowd control, armor plating will no longer apply. And that is wild because there is a ton of crowd control in this game and some crowd control effects are subtle but they last for a long time most notably a lot of the slows in this game they last for a decent amount of time yeah you don't normally think about them that often but that'll strip your armor plating so yeah i made a video actually a very very well timed video considering this change which goes over each of the different status effects and crowd control effects and paladins it teaches you how to distinguish between them, how to counter them, and anything that's listed in this crowd control types chapter of the video will uh, basically counter armor plating now. So slows, roots, cripples, stuns, polymorph, etc. The one thing here that likely won't is knockback, because knockback doesn't apply a duration-based effect. So there might be a split second where a knockback will strip your armor plating, but for the most part, I don't think this one really applies that well. And it's also important to distinguish because there are status effects in this game as well, like anti-healing or a reveal, for example. These are not crowd control effects, so if you're revealed, it's not going to strip your armor plating. This is a totally different thing, it's not a crowd control effect. So I definitely recommend watching this video brushing up on the distinction and learning how best to counter all these effects um because yeah <laughs> it's a lot more relevant and a lot more important now it's become a lot more important in season seven with the first the crowd control separation between sentinel and unbound and now this so yeah go watch this video <laughs> but uh yeah back over here into the game so this is the first major nerf, and this is really going to hurt the uptime of armor plating drastically, uh, especially because uh, most champions have some form of crowd control that will mitigate this effect. So we might see a veteran meta emerge, which, hey, I'm actually okay with that, to be totally honest, because armor plating really just slows down the game in a way that I don't think is fun. A damage reduction just, it makes healing more effective, because if you take less damage, then you need less health healed back up. It also, uh, since you're reducing the damage incoming, right, you reduce the credits and ultimate charge that you gain. So, like, if I shoot a Makoa who's got armor plating level 3, deal 21% less damage, I'm going to build ults and generate credits much more slowly. So it just really slows the pacing of the game in a way that extra health simply doesn't, because extra health doesn't reduce the incoming damage, so it doesn't slow anything down. The only thing it slows down is the time to kill. But it does so, again, in a much more healthy way, in my opinion, because your damage just feels so much more impactful, you know? Would I rather see a nice, fat 1,000 bursts of damage from Shaolin, or would I like to see less than 800? Well, <laughs> obviously, I like to see the 1k, right? So, I think it's just more healthy for the game to have a veteran meta, and I think that's what we may be entering due to this armor plating change. We'll have to test it out, and we'll have to see, and maybe they'll walk back on it, who knows, but this is a very major change. And uh, one more important thing to note, this only affects the damage reduction from armor plating. Uh, Sentinel... Uh, or Arcane Warding, excuse me. Arcane Warding is uh, not affected by this at all. Any form of damage reduction from cards or talents or abilities like Inara's Earthen Guard, none of that is affected by this new uh, change to armor plating. It's just this specific damage reduction. Just want to point that out.
All right, so let's calm down with a less frenetic change. <laughs> so Bloodbath has gotten a slight rework, and the version listed in the patch notes is not correct. This version in-game right here is the current effect that is implemented in the game, right? So this is uh, what we should be looking at here, not the version on the patch notes. The version on the patch notes misses one very key detail. So... Bloodbath will now heal you at level 3 for 1,200 health over 4 seconds. So, 300 additional health, but it's spread out over 4 seconds, and it stacks up to 2 times. So, if you get 2 kills, it'll stack 2 times, but if you get 3 kills, you only have 2 stacks. Otherwise, like if you get 3 kills, I think it just refreshes whatever is the longest effect. So, yeah, definitely a lot more healing you get from this ability, which is good. But here's the kicker. Kills true heal you. They just snuck that little clause in as if we wouldn't notice it. It was absent from the patch notes, by the way. It's only listed here in-game. And it does indeed ignore anti-heal. This is true healing. So that is a major, major change. And it still, by the way, will heal you and the ally who got the kill if you get an elimination, not a kill. So you'll also be able to heal your teammates with this. Effectively, Bloodbath just got a lot stronger. They went the route of keeping the item ridiculously expensive but making it have a powerful effect instead of making the item cheaper with a weaker effect. So we'll see how this plays out. I don't know if this will be meta because it is still very expensive. We'll just have to see. But then finally, we have Rejuvenate. And this is another <laughs> very big change. So this now increases your healing output by 10%. Before, it would increase healing received from other players by 10%, but now it increases your healing output. So let me explain why this is such a big deal. Tanks no longer have to buy this item if they don't want to. If they buy it, they're not going to receive increased healing from their support. No. Now the support has to buy it, and the output that they will do will be increased. But... This no longer actively fights back against Cauterize. So in late game... Well, you're going to increase your healing by 30%, but then you're going to reduce all that by 90%. And that's opposed to the way old Rejuvenate worked, where it would basically uh, be added against the Cauterize, so you'd have 90% Cauterize, and then you'd subtract the 30% from that to get 60% anti-healing, where you'd basically quadruple your healing in late game. That's not a thing anymore. So... Yeah, late game healing just got a whole lot more difficult, but we just got a whole lot more build opportunities because, A, tanks don't have to buy Rejuvenate if they don't want to anymore. Uh, some tanks might still buy Rejuvenate. You could see potentially buying it on ROM or Con, for example, because they do some healing. But uh, you don't have to buy it, so it frees up an item slot for you to buy Morale Boost or Nimble or Chronos or anything like that. Uh, and also... Yeah, you could buy it on ROM and potentially increase the healing you do to yourself from your soul armor. Very crazy potential idea. Or maybe rejuvenate bulk up buck or anything like that. Uh, it's a very interesting idea to shake up the, uh, the meta when it comes to this item. But my fear is that for the average player, uh, this will make tanking a little bit too difficult. Because... Uh, Without the ability to completely counteract Cauterize, right? Without being able to fight back against it and quadruple your late game healing. Uh, people, <laughs> I, I don't know if people will be ready to handle it. Because you're going to have to be a lot more dependent on good ability usage, good usage of barriers, shields, and also utilizing natural cover. Your positioning is going to be a lot more important. So that way you can cleanse Cauterize and let your healer heal you up in late game. So... This might end up being a little bit more of an anti-average uh, slash new player move, but it could also be better for them, because now the support can just buy Rejuvenate and increase their healing output, regardless of if their tank decides to buy Rejuvenate or not. Because I know that is also a frustration when you as the support want your teammate to buy Rejuvenate, and then they don't. So... Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Also, finally, of course, since only one person potentially on the team has to buy it, um, there'll be a lot less credits sunk into Rejuve, which opens up more opportunities for other items. So this is going to shake up meta quite a lot. Both of these changes are going to shake up the meta, and we're going to see <laughs> a drastic shift in the items that people purchase. Very, very exciting. So now let's get into the champion balance. So up first, we have Cassie getting some buffs. These are very 
interesting buffs. So the Blast Shot is getting a damage bonus, and this bonus is in the form of a poison that ticks down over 3 seconds and does 12% of the character's max health. So if I just come on over here to Fernando and BAM! <laughs> Look at that, 92 damage per tick. On a character as tanky as Fernando, that adds up to quite a lot of damage, and we can potentially double the damage we do with our Blast Shot, if not more, depending on the health of the character. Now, it'll be a little bit less effective on someone like Ying, and another thing you'll notice is that the DOT does actually have fall off. We're down to 27 per tick on Fernando, so if you're farther away from the explosion, you do actually get less DOT, which is kind of an interesting interaction. I didn't expect it to work like that, but it does indeed do that. The next effect is that Disengage now applies a 35% Freeze for 3 seconds, and Freeze currently behaves the same way as Slow, it just has an extra visual effect attached to it, but it also appears to be bugged on the PTS too. Um, <laughs> the visual effect doesn't seem to be there. So yeah, if I just do this, you see the arrow, that arrow indicates the slow. And remember what I just said about armor plating. This uh, only applies the damage reduction when you're not affected by crowd control. Cassie just gained the ability to apply crowd control to somebody for three seconds. So if I disengage Ying for the next three seconds, well, armor plating doesn't affect her. So I'm doing my normal amount of damage and it's unmitigated by armor plating. So that's actually a very impactful buff for her. It's twofold. You get a little bit of extra crowd control. Also, it allows you to pierce armor plating. So you'll end up doing more damage during those three seconds, even if you're not picking big game, which is the talent I just happen to be playing here, because I'm sure you all want to see what happens to this Fernando, right? Percent based damage on blast shot, percent based damage on big game. Let's go. Bye. And, uh, well, the DOT doesn't kill him. <laughs> it's so close. 154 extra HP, and he lives that. But, yeah, it does a lot of damage. And this is base kit, by the way. No need for impulse. So this is going to make Cassie a lot better versus tanks, which is a matchup she can sometimes struggle with. So, yeah, a very interesting little changes here for Cassie. I know she hasn't been performing super well for a while now, so looks like they're trying to buff her up in a way that isn't just buffing her fire rate, which was the last idea they had for her. <laughs> and it wasn't a very good idea either. Now we get to Caspian, who has been underperforming for a long time now. Caspian throughout his history has either been S tier or D tier, with no in between. And right now he's D tier, so they have to buff him up. And <laughs> I hope these don't put him back into S tier, but who knows? So Caspian just lost a lot of weight, a lot of bloat, because the Rogue's tempo just it got so much cleaner, so much smoother, it's better. So Rogue's tempo has basically had like 15 different projectile speeds, depending on the amount of love and war stacks you have. That's gone now. It's just one set speed, no bloat, no drama, no projectiles that move slower than a horse. It just goes this fast now. Which is so nice. That's so nice. That's so much better than the, the slow piece of garbage we had earlier. So that is a lot more consistent. Great change. Next up, he now, as I'm sure you could see there if you were paying attention, he now cripples with his ability. For two seconds. <laughs> now, I think that cripple is a little bit too long. For context, Vora has a one and a half second long cripple, and she can only cripple somebody after building up five darkness stacks. So, this cripple, being a lot more easy access because you don't need stacks to build it up, crippling for two seconds, and also potentially, by the way, hitting multiple people, I think that duration is too long. I think you could settle for one second and have it be absolutely fine. Because even a one second cripple is still so much better than the slow he had previously. It's not quite as powerful as a stun, but it'll still let him interrupt a lot of movement abilities and stop people from getting away, which is exactly what you want if you're playing someone who has, well, a sword. And also we got some cooldown buffs. So the cooldown of Rogue's Tempo has been decreased down to 9 seconds, and Deadly Momentum has been decreased down to 11 seconds. So overall he's going to be doing things slightly faster. Except when it comes to the Rogue's Tempo, he's going to be doing things a lot faster, because he also got a buff to Measured Cadence. <laughs> this talent will never not be meta for this character, will it? This now... Uh, instead of applying a weaker slow on the Rogue's Tempo, we'll now instead reduce Rogue's Tempo's cooldown by 15% on hit. So we grab this, we use Rogue's Tempo, and then we just start blasting. And look at the cooldown go down. Yeah, so that's a nice bit of cooldown reduction there. And it means that you're going to be crippling people even more often. That uptime is another reason why I think it shouldn't be 2 seconds. Is that's just really, really 
good. Really powerful. Evie got a change, technically. <laughs> uh, so her Ice Storm now applies a themed freeze instead of a slow. Like I said, there's no difference between a freeze and a slow apart from the visual effect. But also, like I said, the visual effect is bugged on the BTS. So you can't even see the new visual effect. They're just slowed, and that's that's it. Actually, is the slow even working? Okay, the slow is working, but yeah, the freeze effect is just not there. So, um, <laughs> silly change means absolutely nothing. Not a buff, not a nerf, literally just an aesthetic change. Now, I can't show you this right now, but Io's sacrifice will now indicate on her health bar to enemies that she will not die when actively using the sacrifice. So just a small quality of life change to make it easier to read. Kasumi got a few buffs as well, and she is fighting with Caspian for last place and has been winning when it comes to the flank class. So she, yeah, has also been, you know, g given a nice little bit of treatment here. So she has a little bit more health now. Her health has been increased from 2100 to 2200, and with the max health card, she now has 2450 health. And also her Yokai doll, it has a slightly tighter targeting cone now of 4.5 units down from 6 units. Hard to really tell, but yeah, it is a little bit harder to aim, I guess, technically. Now, they have also increased her bonus shield damage from 200 to 250, but she can no longer buy a Wrecker. And I find it a bit confusing why they've done this for shields, but they haven't done it to deployables. You can still buy Bulldozer, but deployables and shields effectively work the same for Kasumi, because she can't build stacks against them. So, I don't understand why Wrecker's disabled, but not Bulldozer. Shouldn't they both be disabled? Seems a bit weird to me. But then the final thing, which is actually a very good buff, uh, her Cursed Target Damage Output Reduction has been increased from 2 to 3% per stack. So whenever she applies Cursed Stacks to an enemy, she will basically apply a Damage Reduction debuff. So they will deal less damage. And, um, yeah, if I just go ahead and put 5 stacks on her, you'll see that... I can tank four shots. And you actually couldn't do that previously. I just tested it when I recorded uh, yesterday's video. <laughs> I died and uh, it was very awkward. So yeah, with the increased health buff and also with this damage reduction buff now, she is able to tank a lot more damage. And also that curse uh, damage reduction is very powerful because it reduces their damage not just against Kasumi, but against everything. So they'll be doing less damage to shields, deployables, other teammates, and yeah, that's a very potent buff for her. Ultimately, I think Caspian got the better deal. I think he got more buffs than Kasumi, but uh, still good to see some love for Kasumi because she is uh, still trying to play catch up with the other uh, flanks in the flank class. Okay, so now it's time to talk about the Kinesa soft rework. She is getting a ton of changes this patch, starting with two talent changes. Reposition has been nerfed. Its range has been reduced to 75 units, down from 100, so a small distance nerf. That's actually the smallest nerf to reposition, though, that we'll see today, because when it comes to the card changes, the card changes actually might be even more brutal to this talent than what they did to the talent directly. But then also, Octopressor has replaced Oppression. Now, you might be saying, well, hold on a second, Andrew. Isn't there a card called Octopressor? Yes, they have turned it into a talent. So Oppressor Mines now target up to five enemies when you use this talent, and you can have up to three active at once, so you get an additional mine. And this is just a talent now, so you can potentially run this with a build that looks like this, and you can just enjoy your mind spam, but in a little bit more of a healthy way than oppression. And a more fun way, arguably. So yeah, you throw that out, and it just automatically targets the enemies. And you'll notice something as well. You see that arrow? That is a slow. <laughs> So she now, with her mines, without a talent, this is not an Octopression thing, this is just a generic thing. The mines now apply a slow, which is how she used to function way back in the day. And this is very important because Kinesa gets shut down by armor plating normally, right? It reduces weapon damage. But if she can slow people with the oppression, oppression mines, that's crowd control. That'll shut off the armor plating, allowing her to do full damage once again. And, with Octopression, uh, you'll also be able to apply that to potentially the entire enemy team, which also really helps your teammates out, because you could just have a mine targeting someone you're not even looking at, but your teammate is looking at them, and they'll start to do full damage to them. It's a very wonderful thing. So, this is actually a very powerful buff for Kinesa in the context of the new change that just happened to armor plating. Now, also, 
Um, we have a whole bunch of changes to talk about regarding her weapon. The carbine rifle has been uh, kind of retooled, and it is a lot better now. Because it has more impact per shot. It does fire a little bit slower, but that does help with your ammo economy. You'll be reloading less. And it's also much, 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 much more accurate and much better at medium range. So back here, this is the new max range for the full damage on this. And you can see how accurate it is. We're still hitting most of those shots on Fernando over there. So, yeah, the accuracy has been greatly improved. And also... We have much better fall-off curves now. The fall-off is a lot more gradual. In general, you can use the carbine a lot more effectively at these medium ranges. Is it still as good as something like Tyra's rifle? Probably not. But as a sidearm for Knessa, it's a lot more reliable. And then we get into the sniper change. This is where the fun begins, or rather, where the chaos begins. So, first of all, she is less zoomed in, which is really nice. I'm glad to see that. I don't like being super zoomed in, so we can see a lot better on our sides now. We have less tunnel vision, more peripheral vision. It's just great. But watch what happens when we shoot. 1,000 damage? Uh? <laughs> yeah, so they have made her shoot a lot faster. You can see that charge rate is lightning fast they have reduced it by half a second from one and a half seconds down to one second and we do a thousand damage so it's just a thousand damage per second now and yeah that means we are no longer two-shotting most champions in the game without a little bit of extra health from either a follow-up shot or from the mines or from another teammate coming in swooping and finishing the kill uh yeah it's it's gonna take a bit of adjustment and a bit of getting used to uh having that lower uh i guess the amount of damage, having a higher kill threshold where you're going to be three tapping a lot more consistently. But in general, with the zoom change and also with the fire rate change, uh, we are feeling a lot more fluid in terms of how fast paced we can make our gameplay. Uh, so, a very, very interesting change regarding the sniper. It feels wrong not seeing 1200 damage pop up here. I was expecting, you know, a reversion to the fire rate nerf that happened around the time of the Ruby update and her to keep the 1200 damage, but they have gone even more extreme than that. Nerf the damage, buff the fire rate even more. It's like a weird halfway point between the old Eagle Eye and normal Knesso. But they've also changed her ultimate, so the ultimate now has a sort of charge economy, similar to Grover or Androxus's ultimates, where as soon as you pop the ult, you do drain an initial lump sum of ultimate charge. But then, depending on the amount of shots or the amount of time you channel it, yada yada, you will slowly drain more of your ult, and if you don't use all of it, then you will preserve some of that ultimate charge. So if I pop E, it now lasts for 8 seconds, we have more of an opportunity to use it, and every carbine shot will drain 2%, and every regular sniper shot will drain 8%. So we are able to actually keep a lot of our ultimate charge there, and wow, those mines build that back quickly, don't they? <laughs> Jeez. So yeah, if you don't use all the ultimate now, you'll be able to save some of it. You'll have more of an opportunity to actually use it in the first place. In general, a lot more uptime on Headhunter, which is partially, I'm sure, why they nerfed her base damage. Because imagine if you could have this much uptime on a one-shot. Yeah, it doesn't even one-shot anymore. It does 2,000 with the ultimate on a direct headshot like that. Now, let's talk about her cards. So, the first thing relating to her cards is they actually put one of them in base kit. You can now use the transporter... 30% faster, and they have reworked that card into something different. So let's just uh, let's just swap over to my main build, and let's take a look at these cards. So, Beam Me Up is the card that would originally increase the duration of the, or uh, the travel speed of the transporter. That now reduces your damage taken by up to 20% during the transporter. Now the irony of this is, since they put it into base kit and made her transporter travel faster, you actually have less time to take advantage of this card than you would have had they not put that into base kit. So, <laughs> kind of an interesting little note there. Uh, they have also, of course, replaced Octopressor with Aftershock, which now causes the Oppressor Mind Slow to linger for up to two seconds after exiting, which is potentially very powerful for the reason I mentioned earlier of it shutting down armor plating. Then, we also have a very sizable nerf to calibrate. This, well, the nerf is twofold. First of all, the actual number nerf. They just lowered it to 0.12 seconds as opposed to, what was it, 0.15 seconds? Yes, 0.15 seconds. 
But the second sort of nerf to this is, if I swap over to a Carbine build, since you fire slower, you get fewer procs of the cooldown card. So, yeah, in general, it's a lot slower than the previous sort of Carbine spam you could achieve. So, yeah, definitely a sizable nerf, and that will, of course, hurt the reposition playstyle if you choose to go Carbine only, but also the Carbine buffs kind of make up for it, so I don't know. If you're a Carbine only Nessa, let me know how you feel about all that in the comment section down below. But the even bigger nerf to, uh, <laughs> to reposition is, well, power supply. You'll notice something. It's gone. <laughs> it has been completely reworked. Power Supply was, I believe, Kinesa's most popular card because it would uh, drastically, it would basically reset your uh, your cooldown of reposition whenever you reached a certain threshold of HP. So whenever you got low health, it would reset the cooldown of the reposition, and it had a ridiculously low internal cooldown. So it was basically mandatory. It was a super powerful card. And it's gone now. No more transporter reset whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, now it provides 2% ultimate charge if you hit a headshot. And, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of an interesting new effect it has. Definitely a hard nerf to reposition, because obviously if you have fewer transporters, there's less of a need for reposition. But the very unique thing about this card is, well, if you use your ult and you use your carbine, you basically spend 2% of your ultimate charge per hit with the carbine. But with power supply, you generate that 2% back. So check this out. Not draining my ult as long as I hit a headshot. You can preserve a lot of ultimate charge by doing that. Now, proportionally, it is actually a lot weaker on sniper shots. You, you have a slower fire rate, and you're consuming more ammo, so... Technically, it's a little bit weaker, but it's still, you know, a boost to your ultimate charge. And it'll help you preserve this a little bit more. It's generally just a good tool for keeping your ultimate up. So, will it become a meta card? I have no idea, but it's a very interesting card, to say the least. And finally, you know the worst card in the game, Lion Wait? It's still trash. Um, they've just reworked it. Uh, <laughs> after standing still for one second, your sniper mode scope zooms 5% further. Oh, uh, boys, so let me put this at level 5. Uh, go back over here and... Uh, Bruh, do I have to, like, scope out and scope in again? Oh, yeah, there we go. Now we're zoomed in. So now, now that I have stood still for one second, I have more tunnel vision, less peripheral vision. This card might be even worse, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> oh, boy. It's, it's, it's truly something, man. It's truly something. Now let's talk about Koga. Koga is indisputably the strongest flank in the game. He has a, what is it, 64% win rate at high elo? The highest win rate in the entire flank class. Very good pick count. He's busted on controller. And what did they do to him? They gave him a slap on the wrist. This is the nerf. He moves slightly less quickly. He still has a movement speed buff during Dragon Stance, but it's gone down from 25% down to 15%. And that's it. My assumption for this is that they're cooking up some bigger Koga changes in the background, because he is far too dependent on Adrenaline Junkie. He's also ridiculously strong, and that combination is not very good. So I'm guessing they'll look at him more in some other update. <laughs> But for now, yeah, just a light little slap on the wrist. Now, if I had to declare a biggest winner of this update in terms of overall healthy balance changes, I would have to declare that winner Maeve. Maeve, well, <laughs> she's, uh, she's cancer-free. She's tumor-free. They've gotten rid of the thorn in her side. Street Justice, well, it's still technically here. The Talon is still called Street Justice, but they have made it so much healthier for the game. The big problem with old Street Justice is that it basically gave her an execute on a very low cooldown ability that could be reset by nine lives. So it was super spammable. It was just annoying. Every single other execute in the game is applied on an ultimate, whether it's Lex, Vora, Drogos, Yagaroth, etc. Maeve broke that rule, but now 
she has a brand new ultimate talent. So Street Justice makes it so that when you activate Midnight, you reset Pounce's cooldown. During Midnight, Pounce executes targets at or below 40% health, so the execute threshold has gone up, and Midnight's duration is increased by 2 seconds. So let's go ahead and see how this works. Now, first of all, it will still have the Street Justice indicator if you have your ultimate at 100. So if I get this Ying low, you see that indicator. If I did not have my ultimate, that would not show up. The reason it shows up when I have my ultimate, even though I haven't activated the ultimate yet, what? is to let me know that I can press ult and then pounce her to execute her. So that's the indication you have to look out for. But yeah, if I just do this, do this, and then pounce up into the air, I can activate this, and I get my pounce back and I can execute. And midnight lasts for six seconds now, so we have a longer period of time to execute. Now, the important thing to note, I'm sure you're already thinking about it in your head. Andrew, what if they buy Unbound and they cleanse the blind? Do I just have two seconds to pounce them and that's it? No. You get the full six seconds of the duration of Midnight to execute players, regardless of if the blind is applied to them or not. The execute is based on your personal Midnight. You see that Midnight duration bar on the center of your screen? As long as that's on your screen, you can execute somebody. So if this Fernando bought Unbound and he didn't have that blind effect, I could still stab him and kill him. So that's the way it works. It has a lot better uptime than you might have originally anticipated. Now, the one problem I kind of see with this talent is that, well, it's an ultimate-based talent, but it doesn't help you out when you don't have your ultimate. It's more like Blood Reaper and less like Leviathan, and that, I think, is a bad thing. It doesn't provide you any benefit while you're not ulting, and it doesn't provide you a way to get your ultimate faster either. The thing is, with her other two talents, she does more damage, and more damage translates into more ultimate charge. So when you're playing Street Justice, you're actually going to have the worst ultimate generation out of the three talents. And I think something they should investigate doing is possibly giving it a, a boost to its ultimate generation. Say, when you pick Street Justice, you could generate ult 15% faster. That way, you'd actually be able to get a play around with it a little bit more and justify this talent over Cat Burglar or Rogue's Gambit, potentially. So, just an interesting idea, maybe. But I definitely like that Street Justice is no longer a thorn in the side of this character. Her execute is now fair. It's fair. It's fair. <laughs> you can't argue with that. It's fair. It's an ultimate. It's fine. But... It gets even better. Do you remember right before the start of Season 7? They nerfed Cat Burglar for absolutely no reason. It was really stupid. It was really, really stupid, and it was doubly stupid because they nerfed the damage of Cat Burglar when armor plating was right around the corner. And armor plating is a much more egregious version of Haven. Armor plating shuts down Maeve because she only does weapon damage, and, well, <laughs> armor plating affects weapon damage. It was cheaper, it was a lot stronger. It really hurt Maeve. And so, nerfing Cat Burglar right before armor plating came out, just, it was really not a good idea. It, <laughs> it should never have happened in the first place, and the real kicker is, she didn't even need a nerf in the first place. She was very well balanced. Has been for years. So, hey, guess what? They finally have walked back on that nerf. They finally reverted it. Cat Burglar is back to 30% damage within 5 seconds. So, oh, it, <laughs> well, it looks like the implementation might be a little bit buggy in the PTS. Because that is not 30% increased damage. <laughs> but... Yeah, hopefully when it reaches live servers, that'll finally be fixed, and it'll be doing the normal amount of damage that it's always been meant to do. Which, uh, thank goodness for that, it never deserved the nerf in the first place. But, it keeps getting better. Rogue's Gambit also is getting a little bit of love here. Since Street Justice is no longer the uh, increased pounce damage talent, right? You can't just pop pounce on anyone all the time and do the execute and be annoying, right? They have given even more of a damage bonus to Rogue's Gambit. So the damage increase on pounce is now up to 20%, up from 15%. So you are now able to do this much damage. Almost a 500 damage pounce. So... Yeah, uh, just a little bit more damage on that as well. All three of her talents are now in a pretty healthy spot, I would say. Rogue's Gambit is that fun movement-based playstyle. Street Justice is no longer a thorn in her side, and Cat Burglar is back to doing the damage it was always meant to do. Watch this. Just watch this. Just look at your screen and watch this. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Turtle! 
Look at me tower over Fernando. Oh my gosh. They have given Makoa quite literally the biggest buff of the update. Uh, li literally, he's big. Look at this. Small Makoa. Big Makoa. Whoa. <laughs> so his ultimate has gotten quite a silly change. He now physically gets larger during his ultimate. 50% larger, as a matter of fact. Look, he can barely fit through the doorway. So, that is very, very silly. They've also given him buffs to compensate for the fact that, well, when you're bigger, you take more damage. So they've given him greatly increased health, and you can see, if I buy a veteran, I can get up to a staggering 12,390 HP with Leviathan. That is a lot. That is a chunky boy. On top of that, they have reduced the damage he takes from headshots during his ultimate. So, <laughs> he actually kind of flips the Uno Reverse card out and denies all hit scans from damage. I believe you actually do less damage to his head than his body during the ult. If I understand the buff correctly, some people have told me that's the case. So, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very, very silly, this buff. And I love it. The only criticism I have is he's still doing 550 damage which is lower than his cannonball. I feel like if you're a Leviathan of that size, you should be doing, like, at least 600 damage. But, I mean, I think at the very, very least we can agree he should at least be doing 575. It should match his cannonball damage. Please. Pretty please. Well, this is a familiar change. Moji's Jubilation now harkens back to an old talent. Boom Boom. Yeah, Jubilation has Boom Boom now. You can do damage to the surrounding enemies when you match clock them. Simple as that. So, a nice buff to her damage playstyle. And even though she's one of the strongest supports in the game, I have her in S tier. Her win rate is through the roof. She is insane. She hasn't gotten any nerfs this update. As a matter of fact, barely any supports have gotten changes. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of interesting that they've decided to keep her ridiculously strong and overtuned, but uh, a damage buff is definitely very welcome, because I know Jubilation has kind of been struggling in lieu of Spitshine. So, yeah, that's nice to see. Nyx has gotten a very, very, very nice quality of life change. When you use Royal Presence, you will now have a duration bar on the bottom of the screen like that. That is so nice. And the reason it's good is because you can do this. Right at the end of your Royal Presence, you now know exactly when it's going to end, so you can recast it to get that pull, and you get a lot more value out of the Displacement now. And that's also going to be very um, uh, important and helpful for the Subjugation talent, where you have a root instead of that the uh, that Displacement. So you can do this, and just do your thing, punch, shoot, do things, and then right when it's about to end, you do that, and you root the victor. And that's just a lot cleaner and easier now. It should have been like that from the start, this quality of life is very necessary, very welcome. I'm super happy to see it. She also got some card changes. So, the new order has been doubled in its effect from 30 to 60. Uh, True Freedom has been reworked, and they, it's, it's basically kind of been put into base kit. Realm Breaker can now miss two hits before resetting combo chain at base now, and True Freedom now heals you when landing the final hit of Realm Breaker's combo. And finally, they've buffed Devastating Blows back up to 5 units, so a little bit more range on your bonus damage. Although, I do find it kind of weird that they would buff one of the strongest tanks in the game like that. Very minor buff, honestly not going to change a thing, I don't think, but still a buff. Saris has gotten two talent reworks. Whoa! What? What the heck is going on here? So, Agony and Mortal Reach no longer exist, and honestly, good riddance. Nobody used Agony. It was <laughs> just it's such a lame talent. I I don't know anyone who seriously played that talent. But then Mortal Reach was just a really unhealthy playstyle. It was an interesting idea to let you heal while in Shadow Travel, but with the cooldown reduction cards, it just encouraged a really unhealthy playstyle where you would spend the entire fight in your Shadow Travel, just immortal, you couldn't be killed, but you would also only heal your team, and you wouldn't do anything else. You wouldn't do damage, you wouldn't stun, you would just be a heal bot. Quite literally just a heal bot, nothing else. So, yeah, that talent was just unhealthy, and now we have two very interesting talents. So Forsake now causes Restore Soul to heal over 0.5 seconds, but its cooldown is re uh, increased to 3 seconds. So, this basically makes her work like her sister, Furia. She now provides a burst of healing with a 3 second cooldown. Boom! Yeah, look at that. That is a very speedy burst of healing. 
So, yeah, very, very similar to Furia. Basically, all of the normal healing that's done over the one and a half seconds is condensed into just half a second. Still has the area of effect, still has all that good stuff. But now you'll be able to heal and then have a lot more time to start shooting and blasting and stunning and stuff. Look at that, I can get a full stun off before my heal is back on cooldown. And yeah, this fixes a problem that Ceres had at high elo, where she spent too much time channeling her heal, not enough time doing other things to support the team. Namely, yeah, her stuns, uh, her damage, and also her ultimate. So this will allow her to still have, you know, actually improved ultimate generation, because you'll still be able to do a ridiculous amount of healing, and you'll be able to have more time to do damage, which builds your ult even further. Also, you will be able to burst heal people better in late game. If you only have half a second to heal someone out of cauterize, you'll be able to deliver a lot more healing. You'll get more kills. It generally is a talent that fixes her playstyle for those higher skill lobbies. And in general, even in the mid to lower ranks, I'm sure it'll be a great option because, yeah, it still has the benefits of doing more damage. It's just, it's good all around. So this is a very nice main healing talent for her now. I really like this. And then the other talent is a little bit more strange. It's a kind of hybrid utility talent. If you rend soul on a target with maximum soul orbs, uh, basically if you stun a target, they will take 20% increased damage for three seconds. So if I grab that, go over here, and then I shoot the ing. Notice how we do 210 damage, detonate. Now we do 242 damage. So after stunning people, they will take more damage. And this is a damage taken debuff. So that means all of your teammates, if they were to shoot this ying, they would deal increased damage too. Very, very powerful, right? Because you can imagine, well, check out this combo. We ult, boom. We put the solar stacks up, we detonate. Now all of them are taking increased damage, except Fernando for some reason. I guess I didn't have four stacks on him. And then imagine a blaster comes in and just blows them all to smithereens, right? We do that, boom, 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 boom. And it's just total carnage, total devastation. I mean, it could be powerful, but it's also a little weird because it kind of is fighting for justification to be picked, right? Do you pick it over Soul Collector as the secondary support, the damage support? Do you pick it over the new uh, Forsake talent as the main support? I don't know. Is there an argument for that, or isn't there? Kind of the uh, the weirder talent of the three at this state in time. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Saris got two very bad talents replaced with one certainly great talent, and one talent that's certainly a lot more interesting than its predecessor. So overall, I'd say this is a very successful soft rework. <sighs> All right. Let's talk about Seven. <laughs> seven. Oh, boy. I'm going to get brutalized for this. I'm going to get murdered, massacred, crucified for this. And it's not my fault. Seven has been killed. Again. Um, they, they, they saw his dead corpse from the last time they killed him. And they took it behind the shed. And they pulled out the 12-gauge. And they just went, bah, bah, and they killed him again. It's bad. He's he. I already put him in D tier on my last tier list. He's going down to F tier. And I know there are already people on Palacord, people in the 7 community, people just in general, people in my own comment section, who are going to say I killed this champion again. I don't have that power, and also I hate every single one of the changes they have just done to him. So, oh boy. Let's just, let's just get into it. So... Uh, let me just let me just pick tribunal upgrades, I guess, and let me let me show you. So, hey, it starts off pretty good, right? Seven can grapple enemies in uh, his base kit again. Yeah, he can do this. Look, I picked tribunal upgrades, not overcharge. I can still do that. That's great. And uh, yeah, grapple has a lower cooldown. Except, wait, 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 wait a minute. I only have one charge. Oh, I only have one charge of grapple. They took away one charge of grapple from this character at base kit. So now Tribunal upgrades and Spring Loaded both only have one charge of the grapple. I, t I don't think I even need to tell you why this is bad, but I'll tell you why it's really bad. So, overcharged back uh, in the day, and by back in the day I mean like back, I don't know, a few months ago, overcharged allowed you to grapple enemies just like this. 
but it took away one charge of your grapple, and it was one of the worst talents in the game. The reason for that is, Seven is extremely dependent on his mobility to stay alive. He has no defensive ability, he barely even has defensive cards. So, he needs that mobility, and when you take away one charge of the grapple, and also allow him to displace enemies with the grapple, what you have is, well, if you're using it for mobility, then you're not able to use it for the displacement, and so what's the point of even having the displacement? But, if you do use it for the displacement, you are a sitting duck, right? I do the grapple, and then I have the dodge roll, and that's literally it for the next few seconds. So I have basically no mobility on a glass cannon who has no defense. It, overcharged was horrendous, and now, that is default 7. That is default 7. If you pick Tribunal Upgrades, that is your experience now. If you pick Spring Loaded, it's actually even worse, because it all gets worse. Because Explosive Dodge has had its cooldown increased from 7 to 8 seconds. I kid you not! Look at these patch notes! Look at this! <laughs> what? What? So, yeah, there's no point in picking Spring Loaded in 2024. It's literally as bad as Overcharged used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, okay, I guess, uh, here's the buff they gave to compensate. The knight is back up to this scaling. It, the, the knight is now the same scaling as Latch and Fire. Whoop, woohoo, yay. But, if you want old 7 back, if you want, if you want normal 7 with his double grapple back, you can still have it, because you can play overcharged, and you gain an additional charge of your grapple, but his cooldown is increased by two seconds. So back to the normal grappling hook. Except, you still have the explosive dodge nerf! So either way, no matter which way you cut it, no matter which talent you play, Seven has either gotten a moderate nerf, or just a hammer dropped on his head. Either way, it's terrible. And this guy, I mean, he was in third place when it comes to the worst flank in the game competition, right? Caspian and Kasumi were duking it out for first and second, and Seven was an easy third. But now, if these go through into live, if these changes go through into live, I'm going to have to make the F tier just for Seven. It's that bad. It's that bad. Because... <laughs> Yeah, also with overcharges, another thing to point out, yeah, I guess you can have your two charges of the grapple back, but that comes at the cost of not having tribunal upgrades, as before, for your bonus burst mode damage. So, that's also kind of a nerf if you think about it. It's all just bad. I mean, he has a terrible pick rate, a terrible win rate, and they looked at him and decided, hey, what if we just made him ten times worse? And I know people are going to blame me for this, because I'm infamous as the Seven hater, right? And literally, I regret uploading that Eevee video a, a couple days ago. I really do. Because in that video, I got frustrated fighting a 7, and I said, Hey, gosh, this guy needs another nerf. It was a, it was a, just me being frustrated in the heat of the moment, saying something stupid. I don't actually mean it. And the devs couldn't have even acted on that if they wanted to, because it came out a, literally a day before we got the PTS. That's not enough time to put a change in motion. But people are going to blame me for it anyways. They're going to look at that and be like, Hey, Andrew Chicken killed Seven again. So, I want to rebrand myself. I am no longer the president of Seven's Hate Club. I resign from my seat as the chairman of the president of the, the king of the Seven's uh, Hate Club. And I am walking my little booty down across the street, and I am signing up to become the president of Seven's Fan Club. I... Do not think these nerfs are appropriate. I think that, okay, let's say you want to rework 7 to have less mobility. That's fine. But you have to give him something in return. These are just hard nerfs through and through, no matter which way you cut it, no matter which talent you play. And that's not okay. So, he needs a lot in return to make up for these nerfs, or he just shouldn't get these nerfs, period. This is going to kill the character... Even harder than he originally got killed, <laughs> like like half a year ago. Like th this is this is awful. And the worst thing is, I published my seven manifest. So look at this. Back when I still had long hair, this was ten months ago, where I talked about the ways in which you could fix seven and make him still have a fun mobility-based play style. You could keep 
a lot of what's fun about him, but you could reduce the bloat, give him better abilities, overall a healthier kit to play, and to play against. And if they had just done this, we wouldn't be in this problem. <laughs> it's a well-thought-out guide. I got the approval of seven mains. <laughs> it's so sad. It really is so sad. How the answer is right here, and... We're getting massive seven nerfs instead. So, don't you dare go pinning this on me. This is not my fault. I already know there are a ton of people, I've already had a ton of people saying I've killed seven. This is not anything to do with me. I don't even have that power. And the devs should not go through with this. And if they want to change his grapple to be like Forest Tendril, where he only has one at base kit and he has a talent where he has two, they need to give him something in return, because Vora, you know, Vora can get away with one tendril in base kit. She has percent base damage, she has really good sustain, she has obliterate for immunity frames, she has an execute ultimate, she has really good damage reduction cards, she has all of these tools to help her get away with having much less mobility than Seven. Seven has none of that, that's the key problem here. So, yeah, if you want to do that, fine, but give him something in return, please, I beg of you. Okay. Now on to an uncontroversial change. Strix, just like Kinesa, now is less zoomed in, so you can see more in your peripheral vision, less tunnel vision, overall easier to hit shots in my opinion. Excellent change. Now Terminus has been one of the best tanks in a while based on his win rate. I have continuously undervalued him. In my banner's fall update uh, tier list, I put him in B tier. B tier! And... Yeah, that was incorrect, so I bumped him up to A tier in my recent tier list, and I'm starting to think that might have been a little bit too low. I might have, I maybe should have put him in high A tier, or possibly even low S tier. His win rate stats are through the roof. Like, they are bonkers. He is winning a lot of games. And so the devs have decided to nerf him. And, well, they've nerfed him in a, a bit of a weird way. The first nerf absolutely makes sense. They have nerfed Undying by 5% from 20% down to 15% damage reduction. But the second nerf, I definitely disagree with. And that is this. He does 25 less damage now on his axe. Why? I don't know. The damage I have never perceived to be the problem with Terminus. Because he's a melee character. He should hit hard when he's in close quarters. So, I didn't think 650 damage was a problem. At all. What was a problem, in my opinion, was the just sheer crazy amount of survivability he could have. Because he could stack Undying with Strength of Stone, and also have really good Power Siphon uptime, which is one of the best abilities in the tank class. Block infinite amounts of damage, have really good uptime. That level of survivability is bonkers. And I thought that was what was making him so strong. But the devs have decided, hey... Damage nerf instead. I don't know. It seems kind of weird to me. Let me know what you think about it in the comment section down below. I think I would have preferred maybe instead also setting Strength of Stone down to 15% damage reduction or nerfing Undying to 10% or something like that. Um, this, this just feels a little bit strange, honestly. Torvald also got a very, very tiny nerf, but still a nerf nonetheless. He does five less damage now. Okay, it is actually a sizable nerf, because you'll notice we take one additional shot to kill Ying now. And, yeah, well, that damage definitely does add up. I mean, yeah, that's that, that's a nerf. It's a nerf. He, he does less damage now. He no longer has the same DPS as Ruckus and Rom. Though he might still be out-damaging them anyways, because he has pinpoint accuracy and no self-slow, so... There's still that extra utility that they don't have. But, uh, yeah, regardless, he's doing slightly less than 800 damage per second now. He's still Torvald, though. He still has incredible self-sustain, the properties of his shield, denying ultimate charge, lifesteal effects. Uh, he still has his ultimate, being a very good disruptor. And he still has Nullify, and Nullify got shadow buffed this update, because, going back to the armor plating changes, armor plating uh, only reduces the damage you take from weapons while you're not affected by crowd control. Nullify is crowd control, so if I nullify this Ying, and my teammates shoot at her, they are not going to have their damage diminished by any sort of armor plating. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yay, go Torvald. He's, uh, he's probably still going to be S tier, honestly. Tiberius has also gotten a lot of love, and that is absolutely excellent, because, well, I have crowned him as the forgotten DPS. He hasn't really gotten 
any changes or appreciation or just anything. <laughs> he hasn't gotten any players. Like, he's just, he's got, like, nothing. Over the past, jeez, few years now at this point, he's just kind of there. He's not terrible, but he's not great either. He exists as an okay damage champion, but that's about to change. Because Tiberius, well, first of all, he's got three talents now instead of two. Predatory Instincts used to give him two extra bounces on his primary fire. <laughs> just not a real talent. That has just been put into base kit, flat out. All your talents now have extra bounces, which is great. And the new Predatory Instincts now causes it so that whenever you get an elimination during combat trance, the next combat trance will have 25% less cooldown. So, if I just pop combat trance and I kill Ying, bing, 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 bong, bing, 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 bong, kill the Vic, we get 50% cooldown reduction from 15 seconds down to 7.5 seconds, as you saw there. So, you get a lot more uptime on a very powerful ability. This does a lot of damage. So, yeah, it's an interesting little talent. However, it probably won't be meta. And that's because it's a pretty simple talent, but also they have really buffed Vicious Assault. Vicious Assault still has two charges, still does 600 damage if you actually somehow manage to land on somebody with it. But it also now gives 40% damage reduction while airborne, so you are a lot tankier as well. And you can pair this with World Traveler, which is a super underrated card. Reset the cooldown of Crouching Tigron after falling to or below 60% health at level 4. Really easy to get this to proc. 15 second internal cooldown, and it resets both charges of your Crouching Tigron. And I can also pair it with Pouncing Tigron just to make the jump feel a little bit better. And check this out. We get damage reduction, but also... Oh... <laughs> Look at that, the wind-up is so much faster now. They have cut the wind-up down by more than half, from half a second to just 0.2 seconds. That is phenomenal. And yeah, if we just go ahead and get shot by the Cassie... Ooh, hold on, ah, jump up again! And then... There we go, we get both charges back, look at that from our cards. So now we're ready to go and jump again. And again, each of these provide a 40% damage reduction now with this talent. So I think this is going to be the new meta talent for Tiberius. That extra boost to survivability, as well as the extra mobility it already provides, in tandem with this base kit, just really nice quality of life buff, is phenomenal. So I think you're going to see a lot of Vicious Assault players now when you do see someone play Tiberius. Lastly, his ultimate just has a little bit of extra invulnerability when you land using the spin dash, so you can combo into your next ability without having as much fear of dying, which, yeah, that's pretty nice as well. So overall, a lot of love, a lot of quality of life for this champion, and he finally has a third talent. Hooray! Vatu has gotten a buff to Enveloping Shadows, but also a bit of a power shift on his primary fire. So Enveloping Shadows now only has a 2 second internal cooldown, down from a 3 second internal cooldown. And this is paired with the change to his kunai, so he now fires a little bit slower. He now fires exactly once every second, and he does a little bit more damage on the kunai. So the damage per second is actually exactly the same. But he now has just more impact because he's doing 310 per kunai. And because it now has exactly one second to fire rate, it means that with Enveloping Shadows, you now have your cooldown reduction precisely once every two kunai. So if I throw the Shadow Bombs, boom. Kunai. All right, don't get it on that one. But I do get cooldown reduction on that one. Don't get it on that one. And then cooldown reduction on that one. So every other kunai now is when you get the cooldown reduction. It is a lot more consistent with the new Enveloping Shadows and this new fire rate. And also, it doesn't impact the tempo that much. I mean, it definitely does. Like, I meant to shoot at Victor before I dashed there, but I didn't get it on time because of the slower fire rate. But overall, you can still shoot, dash, shoot, ambush, shoot, do all the things you normally do with Vatu. And that extra little burst on the kunai is going to mean that you are much more easily able to secure kills now. The kill thresholds are a lot more in your favor with that extra damage. So, overall, I think Vatu is going to feel a lot cleaner, a lot crisper, and Enveloping Shadows might be back on the menu as a good talent. We'll have to see. Vora has gotten a whole bunch of technical changes on her Harbinger's Wrath, but all you need to know about it is that it is a lot easier to target now. So if I just pop this, you'll notice the camera is a lot better and the targeting is a lot smoother. We can just bam, pop on that Vic, and 
yeah, it's just easier to use now, and you also move a little bit faster. And you'll notice the targeting indicator is different. It's now a white and purple little circle there, and it might seem a little bit out of place, because it's like, oh, isn't the red effect more spooky and edgy and fit in with the darkness vibe? Well, the white and purple actually perfectly mirrors her on-screen UI that's been there the entire time, so it's actually more consistent now than it was previously, which is definitely very interesting. And yeah, overall, it's just much easier to execute people now. The execute's still just as strong, it's just, you know, a lot of people tend to struggle with the weird sort of targeting of it, and so, yeah, this targeting is just a now a, a lot cleaner. Very, very nice quality of life. And finally, the last balance change to discuss. Willow is getting a nerf, and no one is surprised. She is undoubtedly an S-tier DPS. Her win rate is absurd. Her pick rate is absurd. I think she has the highest band count out of any champion right now. She is a monster. And Blast Flower has been nerfed as a result. It has gone from 20% increased damage to 15% increased damage, which is actually a pretty sizable nerf. You can see here that on Fernando, we start at 500, then go up to 575, 650, 725, and 800 is our new max value. The previous max value is 900, so... Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a lot less damage. And it'll definitely impact her position in the meta, I'm almost certain of it. Although... Yeah, she'll probably still be very strong, because what made her so strong in the first place was the combination of Blast Flower with this new Flutter Passive. And the Flutter Passive is still there, and it is phenomenal. So, we'll see where she ends up. She might be high A tier. I don't know if she'll still be S. Maybe she'll still be S, I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, definitely a well-needed nerf. And yeah, that just about wraps up this video for the Tidal Surge update. Let me know what you think about all of it in the comments section down below. Also, of course, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and also check out the Twitch channel. I'll be streaming the PTS, and we'll definitely have a lot of coverage of this brand new update. We'll be trying out the new PvE mode, we'll be trying out a bunch of these balance changes and real matches, we'll be playing Big Makoa! <laughs> I love this so much. But yeah, also if you want to help support the channel, please do consider checking out the Nexus over at nexus.gg slash andrewchicken. Here you can buy crystals, the season pass, DLC, all of this wonderful stuff, and you can support the channel directly in the process. So if you want some crystals to buy the new flashback event pass, then I recommend going over here. It's officially affiliated with Evil Mojo, and it's a great way to support the channel. But with all that being said, thank you guys for watching. I will see you all next time. Peace out.